Hi guys and welcome to our next lesson. So in today's lesson we're going to be taking a closer look at the politics of the Gilded Age during this this era of industrialization and transformation that's going on in the United States. And so we're going to be taking a look at this period and specifically looking at the politics of this period, right? Uh, so let's get started. So we have our objective today, which is we're going to be able to summarize by the end of this uh, the partisan politi politics of this age, and we need to be able. We're going to be able to examine the effect of the political programs and activities of the populists, and we're going to talk a little bit about who the populists are. Now we've already discussed them in a little bit in a previous lesson, but today we're going to be taking a, a much closer, detailed look at at who they were. So the Gilded Age. There was there was a a strong contradiction, let's say, in the Gilded Age, in politics during the Gilded Age. So on one hand, it was known as like the golden age of American political participation. And that's because voters during this period turned out at a higher rate than at any other time in American history. So as you can see, in 1876, nearly 82% of the voting age population turned out for the presidential election. And today, uh, we know that turnout rates for elections, presidential elections even, they hover around a uh, pretty bad 50% when you compare it to what it once was. So uh, definitely on one hand, that was a good thing back then. There was a lot more participation, right? Now, on the other hand, the two major political parties that exist in the United States, uh, then the Democrats and the Republicans, they were riddled with corruption and scandal. Um, basically, politicians during this era spent more time worrying about distributing government jobs uh, to their supporters and managing these urban political machines and basically enriching themselves uh, rather than dealing with important policy issues, right? So these uh, political candidates, they were dependent on something called the spoils system, which um, had basically since the time of Andrew Jackson um, had been the basis of government, right? So political candidates would get support from people by promising them government jobs, by promising government jobs to these political party insiders, right? So during the Gilded Age, though, things were even worse, right? Um, it got so bad that we're going to learn about a uh, president getting assassinated by the end, which finally led to some reform. Now, it's not surprising that during this time, this era of ineffective government, because peop the the people who were in charge of the government were more worried about enriching themselves and getting their friends and family uh, jobs in the government. It's not surprising that during this period, one of the most successful third party movements in U.S. history emerged, and that was the People's Party or the Populists. And again, we've talked about them a little bit. And so they are a political party that reached basically national prominence in the 1890s. And they ran on a platform of policies that, that were aimed at reining in big business and helping especially struggling farmers. So we're going to take a look at next the different uh, platforms of these different parties, the Republicans, Democrats, and the populists, and what they stood for and who, who their supporters were. So first we have the Republican Party. And in the years after the Civil War, the Republican Party pretty much dominated the presidency. Um, you know, they encouraged their supporters, many of them who were veterans of the U.S. Army, uh, to vote as they shot. So to vote for Republicans and against the Southern Democrats, just like they did during the war when they shot against them. Uh, so... These, this Republican coalition, the Republican Party, most of its supporters tended to be to include white Anglo-Saxon Protestants um, and rural Northerners and Westerners, as well as African-American men, right? Because the Republican Party stood 
against slavery and uh, you know fought for equality between the different races right um, now during reconstruction as we learned the republican party you know worked to secure civil rights for black people in the south but the party's commitment to racial equality kind of tapered off and um you know they were became distracted remember from our lesson on reconstruction uh by the late 1870s uh the other the some of the goals of the republican party uh during this period they wanted to promote the expansion of business they wanted to grow business and infrastructure that means you know buildings roads bridges things like that uh, they wanted to grant railroad companies land and subsidies so that they could expand rail lines across the entire continent. Um, and economically, the party supported a strong protective tariff, which is a tax, a tax on imported goods. And they wanted a strong protective tariff to shield American businesses and industry from foreign competition. And they also supported a the gold standard, which is also called the quote unquote hard money policy. And basically what that was, it, it was like uh, where they tied the dollar, the value of the dollar to the gold standard. So a dollar was worth a certain amount of gold. Uh, and so they supported that policy. And these policies usually tended to benefit banks and business owners, right? Now the Democratic Party was a obviously different right they um they you know did not do well in terms of winning the presidency during the gilded age but uh, nevertheless political contests during this time were still hotly contested so they were close and the democrats they they often took control of the house of representatives so they did win control of the congress at certain points uh, so the Democrats, they, they fought for and advocated for uh, more state and local control of government, just like we learned, remember, the Federalists versus Anti-Federalists. So the Democrats uh, really supported more state control. They didn't want the national government to be so powerful. And they also, they opposed the protectionist tariff that the Republicans supported. They did not want uh, high, strong ta uh, taxes on imports, on imported goods. And they really, the Democratic Party, they regarded personal liberty as more important than reform, moral reform, right? So they, they valued more like personal individual freedom than they did care about like the moral reform to help society, right? And so uh, the Democratic Party really appealed mostly to white Southerners and Northeastern city dwellers, so people living in the city. And that included especially Irish and German immigrants. And uh, state governments that were controlled by uh, the Democratic Party, especially in the South, they opposed civil rights for African Americans during Reconstruction. And they even imposed segregation and uh, Jim Crow laws, which we will talk more about in depth. But uh, yeah, they imposed those uh, during this period as well. And in northern cities, strangely enough, so they were obviously the Democrats were powerful in the South, but in the North, uh, they were particularly like really good at operating political machines in, in northern cities. So not rural areas of the North, but in like big cities like New York City, for example, they were really great at operating political machines there. And political machines were organizations in which party bosses or leaders, a very small select group of top political party leaders, they would distribute food and jobs to immigrants and the poor, and they would do that in exchange for their votes. Um, so the most famous of these political machines was called Tammany Hall. And that's right here. Whoops. Right here. So uh, the most famous, like I said, was Tammany Hall in New York City. And this is where a man named William Boss Tweed, he was in charge. He was a political boss there in charge of that political machine. And he pretty much ruled with an iron fist. And as you can see, this political cartoon depicts Boss Tweed. 
And you can see he's saying, it says, as long as I count the votes, what are you going to do about it? Right? Uh, so clearly, he's the man in charge there. Uh, and he was able to utilize and manipulate, uh, especially immigrant communities, by offering them food and jobs in exchange for guaranteeing that they would vote for him and keep him in power and his his um, the other members of his political machine, right? So again, the Democratic Party, very strong in big cities in the North during this period. Now we have the People's Party, also known as the Populists. Uh, that's what they were commonly called. And they really emerged as a big political force in national politics in the 1890s. And this party really found its roots in the cooperative organizations that uh, American farmers had formed after the Civil War, especially including the Grange and the Farmers Alliance. Remember, we, we, we did a lesson that briefly went over some of this. And so the Grange and Farmers Alliance, they were organizations that really called for increasing railroad regulations. Remember, the railroads were taking advantage of the farmers. Uh, and they also issued loans to farmers, sold their crops, and helped to lobby the government to get the government to loan farmers money at low interest rates. So um, the Populist Party was really popular in the Midwest, in the South, where a lot of farmers obviously lived. Uh, and they really represented the interests of farmers uh, who encountered many struggles in the last half of the 19th century. So what were some of those problems, you know, that the populists were able to capitalize on? Um, and so some of these problems in the late, the last half of the 19th century, so the second half of the 1800s were... Uh, the mechanization of agriculture. So, right, we've been learning about industrialization. We've been learning about the new technology and new machines and tools that came about during this period. So that helped to mechanize agriculture as we've been learning. And because of that, farmers were able to grow crops at an enormous rate. Uh, they were able to grow much more on a massive scale compared to uh, before those inventions. And because there was so much, so many crops that they were able to produce, it drove the prices of the crops down. So farmers were making less money. Uh, they were making less profit than they were before the mechanization of agriculture. Also, uh, the another issue was the unregulated railroads. The railroads, remember, they were charging very high rates um, a lot of money to ship crops to markets for the farmers, right? So the railroads were taking advantage of this, uh, taking advantage of the fact that the farmers needed them to get their crops to markets in big cities, right? And so uh, they were really struggling with that. And they also capitalized off uh, the pr protective tariff. So this protective tariff that was uh, supported uh, and passed by the Republicans to try to help out businesses and industry. Uh, it really helped industry, but it really hurt farmers. It didn't really help them. And um, the hard money policy also was particularly distressing and upsetting to farmers because it made paying back loans uh, very difficult. So because of this, the goals, the platform of the populist party was to respond to these struggles and to these issues. So the party, the populist party called for railroad regulation, uh, land reform, and government-backed loans for farmers. And the most important for you to remember, uh, the most important goal and part of their platform was called free silver. So populists they wanted to coin silver. They wanted to add silver um, into the currency in, in addition to gold in order to increase the money supply and promote inflation. So what this means is by obviously there's a limited uh, number amount of gold. So uh, by inc including silver into that, it increases the total amount. Right. So by having more money in circulation, this would decrease its value. Right. When you have more of something, when you have a bunch of something, uh, it, it drives down the value of it. Right. 
So by driving down the value, it helped to make repaying loans easier, right? So, uh, you know, again, more money in circulation decreases value and makes repaying loans easier. And here is the famous, uh, a picture of the famous cross of gold uh, speech that was delivered by a um, one of the most famous um, politicians of this period named William Jennings Bryan. And this uh, speech he delivered, he delivered it at the Democratic National Convention in order to get the support of the Populist Party as he was running for president and he wanted to get uh, the support of both the Democratic Party and the uh, Populist Party. And it did, it was successful in getting him the nomination, but uh, didn't necessarily get him the, the presidency. So in his speech, he supported something called bimetallism uh, or free silver, which he believed would bring the nation prosperity. So he attacked the gold standard, right, that the Republicans supported. And he ended his speech by saying, you shall not cru crucify mankind on upon a cross of gold. Um, and so this is one at, considered to be one of the greatest political speeches in American history. And um, it didn't work. <laughs> so what happened was the populace were extremely successful, especially for a third party. And they won many victories in state and local elections um, in 1892. And they actually won over a million popular votes for their presidential candidate, uh, James B. Weaver. And however, in 1896, the Democratic Party, they incorporated free silver into uh, the platform. And this undercut the necessity of a third party, right? So because the Democratic Party now added free silver to its platform, it kind of made the People's Party not that necessary. It made them kind of irrelevant because you already had the Democratic Party, which was far more powerful and already established. And so the people who supported free silver, which, which, which is what made the People's Party unique, suddenly it wasn't so unique anymore. There was another party that was offering that same thing. So uh, in the end, though, both the Democrats and the People's Party, the populists, lose the election. Republican candidate William McKinley wins the election of 1896, and the United States officially ad adopts the gold standard in 1900, despite uh, what the populists and the Democrats tried to do. So now let's talk a little bit about, you know, uh, the issue of patronage. We're going to talk a little bit about the issue of um, corruption during in politics during this time. So during the Gilded Age, politics were, as I said, riddled with corruption um, as presidents awarded government jobs and positions to their political supporters. So um, corruption and backroom deals and shady compromises, those were big stereotypical of the Gilded Age. And one of the most famous examples was the Compromise of 1877, which we've learned about. I'm going to review it here. And basically it said, it, uh, what it was is um, it resolved the disputed presidential election of 1876. Remember, Republican Rutherford B. Hayes had lost the popular vote. Um, and in exchange for his promise to remove federal troops from the South after the Civil War, um, they, the Democrats awarded the presidency to him. Um, and so he became president in exchange the, uh, in the South, federal troops uh, left. And this benefited Democrats who wanted to end Reconstruction and they wanted to return white supremacy to southern state governments. So this compromise is just, this is like the epitome of corruption during this period, right? And, um, you know, although Rutherford B. Hayes, his, his, uh, his ascendancy to the presidency didn't really, uh, it on its own did not create political corruption in Washington, D.C., but it did set the stage for, like, widespread efficiency 
in the White House for the next 24 years. Basically, weak president after weak president took office, and not one of them was, uh, not one incumbent was reelected. So, you know, the American people seemed to prefer the new candidate instead of the the current president. They they did they viewed them as weak and ineffective. So, once elected many of these the presidents during this period they really didn't have enough power to repay the political favors that they owed to the people who helped them to gain victory in some of the cities and regions around the country so their four years in office their short four years in office were really spent they were trying to repay those favors and to manage these powerful relationships that that had put them into the White House in the first place. So instead of working, instead of working on policies and reform and trying to make the government and the country better, they were more worried about trying to repay back uh, the people who helped get, put them there in the first place. And so among the the political issues that presidents, you know, addressed during this time were really uh, the issue of patronage and tariffs and the nation's monetary system. So let's see, at the heart, at, at the heart of each president's administration, right? At its core <laughs> during this period was the protection of the spoil system, which was the power of the president to uh, practice widespread, uh, what is called political patronage. And patronage in this case took the form of the president basically naming his friends and family and supporters to various political posts. So, um, you know, because the presidential elections were so close during this time, after I just told you about that compromise between Hayes and the Democrats, right? So clearly the popular vote was very close. The Electoral College was very close. Ele presidential elections during this time were very, very close. Um, so because of that, the, you know, it was very important for presidents to maintain this political, uh, this political machine that they had going and repaid favors with patronage. Uh, and that went for all presidents, regardless of whether they were Democrat or Republican, they all did this, right? So here is a political cartoon, uh, and it kind of satir satirizes uh, makes fun of the spoil system. And it shows uh, Andrew Jackson right here. As you can see, he's riding a pig. <laughs> and it's um, the pig is basically walking over. It says, you can't see it. Uh, it's kind of too, too blurry. But it says, uh, it's walking over fraud, bribery, and spoils, right? And the pig is feeding on plunder, right? So it, it's, it's making fun of this spoil system that the presidents basically maintained um, and they rode as they uh, were president of the United States. Um, and here is a table that you can take a look at. So basically it shows that, you know, every single president elected from 1876 through 1892, they won the presidency despite receiving less than 50% of the popular vote. So they did not receive a majority of the popular vote. And this established a cycle of, like I said, relatively weak presidents who owed a lot of political favors that um, could be repaid through uh, patronage. So because of this, the spoil system allowed those with political influence to gain powerful positions within the government, regardless of whether or not they were even experienced or had the skill to, you know, have that position. So this just made uh, the government more inefficient, and it also increased opportunities for corruption during this period, right? So this clearly demonstrates, this, ch this chart shows kind of the issue, all these issues combining to make, uh, you know, politics in this time corrupt and inefficient, right? So during this period, there were debates over how to reform this, this system and to change it and to hopefully change it for the better. 
So uh, at this this time, during this time, a movement emerged uh, in order to, it, they were trying to support reforming the, the practice of political appointments to reform this issue of patronage. So um, even as early as 1872, some civil service reformers, those who wanted to reform the system, they created something called the Liberal Republican Party. And they tried to basically defeat incumbent president Ulysses S. Grant in order to achieve this. And the Liberal Republican Party was led by several Midwestern Republican leaders, as well as newspaper editors. And um, basically, this allowed many other reform-minded Republicans, pe Republicans who wanted to reform things, to break free from the established Republican Party, and they ended up joining the Democratic Party ranks, right? And that's how this party was created, the Liberal Republican Party. And so uh, their candidate for president uh, was a newspaper editor named Horace Greeley, and they called for a thorough reform of the civil service as one of the most pressing necessities. So what they're saying there is that, you know, reforming the civil service is one of the most important things for us to focus on and to do uh, in this country. It's one of the biggest issues facing the nation. So this party and Horace Greeley were defeated easily in the election, uh, but it kind of set the stage for a stronger push for reform later on. Um, so, you know, clearly President Hayes, when he did become president, despite this push for reform, uh, you know, he was elected by very slim margins and he owed a lot of favors to his Republican, you know, political operatives, right? He owed them a lot of favors for helping him win in such a, such a close race. And he was therefore not really prepared to institute any type of reform. He owed a lot of people things because otherwise without them, he probably wouldn't have won. Um, so this was all despite the fact that he personally, he did say out loud, he made it clear that he wanted to reform the system, but it just was like he, he, he couldn't given everything. So he really accomplished little uh, during his four years. He didn't accomplish much while he was president. All he really did was grant uh, a lot of favors uh, as, as was dictated by some of the other Republican Party operatives. Um, and two of them really tried to control, exert control over Rutherford B. Hayes. The first one was Roscoe Conkling, and he was a Republican senator from New York and a leader of this group called the Stalwarts. And the Stalwarts were strongly, they strongly support, supported continuing the spoil system. They didn't want to change it. And they were a long time, you know, Roscoe Conkling was a longtime supporter of President Ulysses S. Grant, and he really didn't sympathize with Rutherford B. Hayes and Hayes's calls, his early calls for civil service reform. He was a he wasn't a fan of it. He didn't want to change things. And then on the other hand, you had James G. Blaine, and James G. Blaine was a Republican senator from Maine, and he was a leader of this group called the Half Breeds, and the Half Breeds got their nickname from the stalwarts and the stalwarts considered this group to be only half republican right because uh, they advocated for some measure of civil service reform they wanted to change things and maybe work on this issue a bit so here is a political cartoon it kind of depicts it shows roscoe conkling he's playing a popular puzzle game of during this period during this time and it's this game with the heads of potentially like potential Republican presidential uh, candidates, right? So he's playing this puzzle game. The heads represent these uh, Republican presidential candidates. And it kind of shows Roscoe Conkling's, his power, his control, his influence over uh, who would be picked to become the presidential nominee from the Republican Party, right? It shows his power, his influence. So... Like I said, during Hayes' presidency, he really he didn't achieve much. He failed to achieve any real significant legislation. Um, he made some efforts to try to ensure African-American civil rights, 
uh, and to grant those, but he was blocked by a Democratic Congress. Like I mentioned, the Democratic Party did gain control of the House of Representative during, uh, Representatives during this period. So they were able to block him from trying to extend civil rights to African Americans even further. So he didn't really get much progress there. And he also decided to halt the coinage of silver. Uh, and this kind of added to the problems of the economic panic of 1873. Remember, that was like an economic uh, depression, recession, and it really hit the economy pretty hard. And his decisions actually kind of made it worse. Um, now, he did try to do some things in regards to civil service reform. Like I said, he, he early on had called for some reform of the spoil system. So he did adopt a few rules. And one of them was he held one rule that he like passed and he adopted was that a person appointed to an office uh, a political office, a governmental office, could be dismissed only in the interest of efficient government operation, but not for overtly political means. So this means that, you know, he could technically, people could be removed uh, only if it meant that it would improve the government, if it would make the government more efficient. But you couldn't just fire people just because they were of a different political party and you wanted to put someone who was more, who was your, your crony, your, your family member, your friend in that position. That, that wasn't going to be allowed anymore. Uh, the next thing that he did was he declared that pol party leaders uh, could not have no official say in political appointments. So he tried to prevent people like Conkling from, you know, influencing and trying to have a say over whether or not uh, you know, people would be appointed to certain political positions. Uh, but of course, Conkling, Roscoe Conkling, he continued to try to do that regardless of this. And finally, the third one, Hayes decided that government appointees uh, were ineligible to manage campaign elections. So people who were, ele who were appointed to government jobs and positions, they were not supposed to allow be allowed to be in charge of managing and directing political campaigns for president, right? That'd be a conflict of interest. So he uh, decided to uh, implement that rule as well. Now, his first target in his reform effort was to remove, for example, Chester A. Arthur, who was a, you know, an ally of Roscoe Conkling from his post as head of the New York City Customs House. Um, and Chester A. Arthur had been famous for using his post uh, as a customs collector in order to gain political favors for Roscoe Conkling. So uh, when, Faye, when Hayes uh, forcibly removed him from the position, a lot of half-breeds even uh, questioned why he did this, and they began to distance themselves from Hayes. So he started to even lose support from the half-breeds. And the half-breeds, remember, they were in support of reforming this system. So the fact that he, obviously, he lost support of the stalwarts, and he lost support of the half-breeds, that means he lost a, a, a large uh, portion of public support. And also, because of the Compromise of 1877, people knew the backroom deal he made with the Democrats, right? That he basically sold out African Americans and removed the federal troops in the South. This, all of that combined, helped him to lose a lot of public support, and uh, basically it sealed his fate. And he lost his reelection handily. He 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 easily lost his election, his reelection. Now, something that does set the stage for civil service reform is uh, a presidential assassination. So after President Hayes's failures, uh, some Republican factions began to battle with each other over who would replace him for the 1880 presidential election. And um, initially, the stalwarts who wanted to keep the spoils system they wanted Ulysses S. Grant to return to the White House and be president again. While the half-breeds, those who wanted to change the spoils system, they promoted a man named James Blaine, remember? Remember James Blaine from 
uh, Maine. Uh, and so following this, this deadlock, right, they couldn't agree, both factions eventually agreed to a compromise presidential candidate, and that was Senator James A. Garfield. And he was from the state of Ohio. And his vice presidential running mate was Chester A. Arthur. So uh, they ran against the Democratic candidate, which was Winfield Scott Hancock, who was a former Union Army commander. Uh, and they ran against each other in the 1880 presidential election. And James A. Garfield and Arthur, his vice president, they won a very narrow victory over the Democrats by about uh, 40,000 votes, although he really, he didn't win a majority of the popular vote still. Now, despite this happening, despite his victory, less than four months into his presidency, uh, some events pushed civil service reform uh, forward very quickly. So what happened was on July 2nd, 1881, uh, an assassin named Charles Guiteau shot and killed uh, the president, James A. Garfield. Uh, and he pretty much, according to some sources, he said out loud, I'm a stalwart of stalwarts. So he's, he didn't want to change the system. He wanted to c keep the spoil system and patronage, right? So, you know, Guito, the assassin, the one who killed the president, he had wanted to be rewarded for his political support. Um, he had written a speech for the president, for the president during his campaign, and he wanted to be rewarded for his help, and he wanted an ambassadorship to France. Um, so he was driven by that, to, by that anger and frustration that he hadn't been given a position and he assassinated the president. And so his actions at the time were really blamed. A lot of it was blamed on the spoil system. And this caused a lot of people who, to, you know, cry out for change, that things needed to change because clearly, look, a president even got killed over this. That's how bad this was. So um, a lot of people were surprised when Chester A. Arthur, he was vice president, right? So he became president after, the, after Garfield was killed. So Chester Arthur surprised everybody uh, when he became president because he distanced himself from the stalwarts, right? He did, he remo he did not associate with them and turned against them. And the stalwarts, again, I'm going to keep reminding you, they wanted to keep the spoil system, right? So before all of this happened, Arthur was a loyal party man, right? He was all for the spoil system. He benefited from it. But he understood after what happened that he really owed his current position as president to no particular faction. No, he didn't owe anybody anything. He gained this because of the murder of the president, right? So he was in a different position. He didn't really owe anybody anything. He was in this unique position and it helped him to usher in a, to bring about a wave of civil service reform, um, unlike anybody else during this period and he chose to to pursue that he chose to do that so in 1883 he signed into law something called the pendleton civil service act and this was the first significant piece of anti-patronage legislation so this law basically created the civil service commission and this uh, commission it listed all government positions patronage jobs right and then set aside about 15% of this list as appointments to be determined through a competitive civil service examination process. So that meant that 15% of these former pat patronage jobs, now they had to be earned and people had to take a test in order to be able to be qualified and to be appointed to those positions with this new law. And it also, it went further and it prevented future presidents from being able to undo this reform, right? So the law declared that um, future presidents could grow the list of jobs that, that had to be, uh, you had to take a test for, you could enlarge in that list, but you could never shrink it. You could never shrink the list by moving a civil service job back into the patronage column, right? So this, this was a, an era of corruption, as we've learned, and it really took 
the assassination of the president for something to finally be, be done to kind of uh, rectify this and to change it and to reform the system. So what do you think? I want to know what impact did the spoil system have on American government after everything that we've learned? And what, again, brought up, what brought on this civil service reform? And do you think, I want to know what do you, what you think. Do you think the Pendleton Act went far enough to correct the problems of patronage? Do you think that there still are might be issues like this today? So uh, let me know what you think. Hopefully you learned something. If you have any questions about this assignment or this anything in this lesson, let me know, reach out um, and good luck on the assignment.